Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris Keeley with the Mass Business Roundtable, a proud co-founder of the Mass Carego Massachusetts Caregiver Coalition, along with some amazing leaders you're going to hear from today, uh, including the Mass Tech Collaborative, Archangels, EMD Serono, Cigna Healthcare, Care.com, SeniorLink, and our great partners at the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, and many more uh, who are participating in the coalition. We appreciate your support and hope you'll join us uh, as members of the coalition as we continue to advocate for family caregivers and collaborate with Governor Baker and his team uh, to make Massachusetts the most age-friendly state in the nation. Before we get started, just a few quick announcements. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. We'll share those links with you uh, afterwards so you can share those out with your networks. Uh, everyone but the speakers will have their cameras off and their microphones muted. Uh, please use the Q&A feature to ask a question uh, or drop something in the chat feature and, uh, and we'll try to get to those questions uh, during the webinar. We also hope you'll tweet about uh, this webinar uh, in, in real time using the hashtag supporting caregivers. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first uh, speaker, the executive director of the Mass Tech Collaborative, Carolyn Kirk, who will kick off this exciting new series highlighting innovation uh, in caregiving in particular. In her role uh, leading Mass Tech, Carolyn uh, is uh, an expert on the state's innovation ecosystem, which includes digital health, cybersecurity, AI, robotics, and FinTech. She previously served as Deputy Secretary of Housing and Economic Development in the Baker Administration, and prior to that served as Mayor of the City of Gloucester. Carolyn, thank you so much for your leadership, uh, helping to grow and strengthen the innovation ecosystem in Massachusetts. We're so excited to continue this important partnership with MassTech, and I invite you to please help us uh, kick things off here. Oh, thank you, Chris, and thank you for all of your work that you've done for the last, oh gosh, couple of months. I think the, the roundtable series that, that you've sponsored uh, has been a safe harbor in, in this storm. So just a special thank you for, for that work and all of your work on the caregiving initiative. I wanna thank also our panelists, our speakers and the staff who make these webinars possible. Um, and I also wanna thank everyone who is in attendance today. The issue that we're gonna talk about today is something that I think is best summed up in the words of former First Lady Rosalind Carter. And she said, there's only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. And all of us are here today because we understand the need to recognize and support family caregivers. And about a year ago, we were honored to launch the Massachusetts Caregiver Coalition with the Mass Business Roundtable and host a leading um, employers in the state. And since that time, we've been struck over and over, and particularly during this public health crisis of COVID-19, at the impact that caregiving has had on people across the Commonwealth. And I'm just gonna share with you a couple of just really staggering statistics. In the, the average caregiver over 50 years of age will experience almost $300,000 in lost wages due to their caregiving responsibilities. And in an average year, the impact on Massachusetts employers through employee turnover, absenteeism, and presenteeism due to caregiving responsibility is about a billion dollars, not to mention the human cost. Research published in August by the CDC showed that caregivers during COVID-19 have seen increased suicidal ideation by 10 times over non-caregivers with almost one third of caregivers considering suicide. With all of these challenges, caregiving represents a vast frontier of opportunity. Caregivers need help organizing their daily tasks, navigating the healthcare system, and delivering a high quality of life for their loved ones 
while still caring for themselves. Given all of these facts in our position as a public agency focused on innovation and economic development, we decided that the time is right to initiate a conversation about ways that we can bring together the Massachusetts innovation economy to support caregivers. The broad demands placed upon family caregivers necessitates a broad definition of what constitutes innovation especially as this intersects with our working lives and our employers. As the line between work and life becomes increasingly blurred, these workplace-based innovations will be critical to ensuring family caregivers can remain a vibrant part of their social communities and workplace communities. And often the first step is to recognize that people within your teams are also spending time as caregivers. As an employer, you might be shocked by the size of this hidden subpopulation and the overwhelming demands. At Mass Tech, we've encouraged family caregivers in our workforce to adopt models of work that best fit their needs. We encourage honest dialogue with managers and HR to help us understand if there are other ways that we can support. But really, sometimes we wish that we had more innovative tools to help facilitate this. Long term, we're investing in our team and helping build our culture, and we want the tools and the innovation to get us there. We're part of a team of state agencies that are focused on this issue. As Chris mentioned, it includes our partners at the Executive Office of Health and Human Services and the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, who both champion this important issue. The panel we assembled today will help frame the broad innovation needs of caregivers while providing concrete examples of technological policy and community innovation. Moderating our panel today will be Alexandra Drain, CEO and co-founder of Archangels, a national movement dedicated to honoring caregivers and connecting them to resources. Alex is also a Mass Tech board member, and we are indebted to her for opening all of our eyes to the breadth of the caregiving challenges that our nation faces. Alex? Hello. Um, I got to just say, Carolyn, I think anyone in Massachusetts is increasingly hearing about you and the extraordinary work that you and Mass Tech are doing. I just want to add that before you were a caregiver to Massachusetts, you were a real caregiver to Gloucester. And as somebody who has spent a lot of time in Gloucester, I encourage all of you go to Gloucester, ask Carolyn to meet you there and walk <laughs> down the street with her because you will see the extent to which she is a caregiver because folks come up to her no matter where she is and say, Carolyn, help me with this. Carolyn, help me with that. Um, so thank you. I'm so, I'm so grateful on behalf of the state of Massachusetts that you are now taking what you were doing for Gloucester and doing it on, an, on a statewide scale. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'm so glad to be here. So with that, I'm gonna, if we can bring our panelists on, that would be fantastic. Um, quickly, I'm Alexandra Drain, and I am the CEO of Archangels, and we are a national movement and a platform that's really designed to reframe how caregivers are seen, how they're honored, and how they're supported. And we do that using a combination of data and stories. And so what I wanted to do today, I think when we talk about economic development, hello, Duncan, um, the rest of you guys, come on. I don't wanna to talk to myself, hello. Um, and when we do that, when we talk about economic development, I think it's important, we all have a heart line, right? We all know, we all have our stories. We all know the importance of this. We, we've all got a, a feeling in our bones about why this matters. Um, but the top and bottom line is something that we haven't done as well historically um, in the caregiver space. And that is obviously what economic development is all about. So I wanna just run through some data really quickly to set the table. So there was a CDC study that Carolyn just mentioned um, Archangels was super lucky and that we got to be a part of that study, um, specifically in making sure the caregiver role was included. And this study showed that 56% of the unpaid caregiver population is struggling with anxiety or depression. That's two and a half times the rate of non-caregivers. Uh, unpaid caregivers are in, um, increasing their use of substances at five times the rate. And then to say again, because I don't think you can say it enough, what Carolyn just said, that a full 33% of caregivers, which is 10 times um, the general population, has contemplated suicide in the last month. And I, I just think there's nothing else we need to say besides there it is. Um, 
We were part of another study with Blue Cross Blue Shield Association that just got published that looked at how caregivers are accessing care. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, this is um, around how, care, how the impact of caregiving on cost of care. Um, that before COVID, we were seeing caregivers utilizing the ER more and having poorer health outcomes to the tune of 26% poorer health. And then a second CDC study that we just published showed that as of COVID, caregivers are delaying or avoiding urgent or emergency care during this pandemic at five times the rate, five times more common behavior for, non, for caregivers versus non-caregivers. Um, and avoiding routine care is 1.5 times more common. So I just wanna say really quickly, think of that superstorm. So you're sicker and you're not getting the care that you need. And that is economic development opportunity if I've ever seen it. That was the data. I wanna share a story really quickly. We all have tons of stories. This is a millennial caregiver. One in four caregivers are millennial. Um, this woman, when we first spoke with her about two weeks ago, did not know that one in four caregivers were, were millennials. She thought she was the only one. And she sent me this note and follow up. I guess I never really thought of myself as a caregiver. I suppose I suppose I give, and I guess I care. I give care to my dad now. I used to give care to my mom when I was in high school and she was alive. Up until a few months ago, I would give care to my patients. Does that make me a caregiver? I guess you can add it to the list. Nurse, sister, girlfriend, girlfriend, daughter, best friend, depressed, insecure, questioning, wanting more companionship, wanting to lay on the beach with my girlfriends and a cocktail, wanting to get promoted, wanting to get a raise, wanting to be successful, wanting to paint all the walls in our apartment, wanting to keep a plant alive, wanting to just be normal, to have a life other than, well, mine. And when I came back and shared with her that suicidal ideation um, quote, and that a full one in three unpaid caregivers have had that in the last month, she cried. She cried because for the first time, she didn't feel alone in her reality. And I think that's part of what we can do um, starting today on this, on this interaction with each other. So um, an Archangel survey that was fielded in May showcased that a full 61% of us answer yes to, are you caring for or worrying about the health of a family member or friend? And 55% of us say that's new as of COVID. Um, the September Department of Justice numbers, women are quitting the workforce at four times the rate. So Duncan Pettigrew, hello, I'm so glad you're joining us. Um, I have laid the table with all these statistics, but I want to turn to you as our first question. Um, you really, I think, are an amazing example of leading with your heart and also bringing your full self to everything that you're doing. And, and I would call it a sort of silo busting, silo agnostic way. You have served as an accountant. You have been a CFO. You played a huge role at Circles, um, which was all about bringing concierge services to the masses. And while you love tech, what you really serve is humanity. And what you're doing now as COO of Kinto, which is your current role, um, is building a service that I would argue is essentially being a concierge for caregivers. Can you tell us about what you're doing and why you're doing it, how your journey took you to where you are now? Yeah, thank you, Alexandra. That's an incredibly generous introduction. I appreciate it. If half of that is true, it's because of the incredible journey I've been on in this space. And so happy to share a little bit about that. Um, so, you know, my work began after leaving, you know, that role at Circles as being a CFO, um, doing research with Red Star Ventures into the sort of uh, the field of aging. And of course, like anyone who gets involved in this space, we very quickly realized the incredible importance that family give, caregivers have in this space, the work that they're doing, and also the fact that they are, as you point out, sort of under-recognized, underserved. We are under-investing in this group of individuals who is doing so much good. At the same time, you know, I was working for a technology company and, you know, we approach this group with a degree of optimism. This is the first generation of people who have grown up, you know, familiar with computing and mobile technology, and uh, and there wasn't, you know, suitable tools and uh, and, and uh, technology to support them. And so we did the obvious thing as technologists. We went out and started building applications to sort of help people with their family care caregiving roles. Um, we got a lot of early traction. You know, we were helping people with, you know, gathering and sharing information, managing tasks, managing family interactions and dynamics. And we got a lot of downloads, a lot of support from organizations like AARP, the Alzheimer's Association and the NIH. But it became incredibly clear to us that something was missing, that, you know, good technology is not the same in this field as a compelling solution. And we had to look beyond, uh, you know, this idea that technology was going to solve this problem. So... And of course, you know, if you work in this space, you know, the, the, the right reason behind that is obvious, you know, 
Caring is an intensely human experience. You know, it involves vulnerability, trust, you know, pain, sorrow, you know, compassion, resilience, all things that require a human connection and that have been missing in our approach to that date. And so um, as we began, you know, working with our partners, we, you know, we're also able to recognize the incredible work that is being done by um, social work professionals in the United States. They are, you know, another group that is incredibly underappreciated. And yet you have these folks who are incredibly skilled, they're experienced, they're empathic, and they are able to work with family caregivers to bring both practical and emotional support. And it doesn't matter if you are rich or poor, what preconceived notions you have of social work, it is that combination of you know, practical support and emotional support that it's really meaningful for people. And so in 2020, we you know, really made a big shift in our approach. You know, we are now with the funding from the NIH, you know, building a service that is creating connections between family caregivers and these individuals that can coach and guide them in their caregiving journey. The feedback has been incredible from the pilot groups. You know, we've had folks say, this has changed my life. Yeah. And, um, and it changes our attitude towards technology. You know, it's not the solution, but it is in service of the solution. And so I would say, and, you know, in summary, you know, this is an incredibly exciting, you know, um, area to work for in, work in from an innovation perspective. Um, I think there's amazing work that we can do, particularly with a focus on scalability. The word concierge sometimes conjures up just for the rich and like we need to make this available to as many people as possible. Um, and the rewards are huge in this space. You know, the opportunity to work with incredible families, to work with incredible professionals and the outcomes are really amazing. So, you know, I'm That's a funny. huge advocate for this. Anyone listening, I mean, obviously check out Kinto and then just keep that in mind. I think a social worker is the ultimate concierge for a caregiver. So yeah. if you know a caregiver and you yourself are probably a caregiver, go find yourself a social worker um, and then get yourself a palliative care consult. Those are two of the most amazing gifts we can give. So Grace Whiting, Come to you, baby. Um, so I'm going to tell you what you'll read about Greece, Grace if you creep up on her, which you should. Creeping is my, my term I've learned for when you search for someone. Um, so please do on everyone, on, on every panelist, go online and read about them because they're amazing and I don't want to waste too much time going through their bio. I'll just say that, Grace, you are the president and CEO of the National Alliance for Caregiving, or NAC, as we all like to refer to it. You are, you have an insane amount of respect. I fangirl you all the, all the time and have for many years and try and sit next to you, as you know, in any meeting. And Grace is like, oh my God, here she comes. Um, you provided testimony to Congress, to national media outlets. You supported, this is very important, two nationally representative studies on caregiving. Caregiving in the US 2020, which was released this past May. The infamous 53 million of us are caregivers numbers, which we know has gone up since then. That was pre-COVID. And then the previous version in 2015, both with AARP um, and NAC collaborating and both cited all the time. If you could think about how many times that thing is cited. I wanna share that uh, I fell even more in love with you when I found out that uh, you grew up in Mississippi and my dad grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. And it turns out Lawrence, who any of you guys know from Mass Tech, um, his mom actually grew up in Jackson, Mississippi. So we have all of these um, ways in which we are uh, connected. So those growing up years, for you, Grace, were incredibly formative, right? They all for, are for all of us, but I think yours were particularly around a topic that you talk about with such ferocity and grace, right? This is matters a lot to you, which is the, the, the short-term versus the long-term perspective on caregiving. And I, if you don't mind, will you share your personal story and how that has informed not only your perspective on short-term versus long-term, but also how COVID is exacerbating that. Yeah, absolutely, Alex. And thank you uh, so much for all the kind words. Um, this field, I think, is benefits from your energy and excitement. So thank you for bringing us together today and, uh, and for all that you're doing for caregivers. Um, so I've been in Washington, just over nine years and at the National Alliance for Caregiving for about seven in various roles. But it wasn't until I got into this work that I really started to realize the impact caregiving had had on my family and in my life. Um, my younger sister, who is a, a brilliant, talented artist, um, a wonderful person, she was actually a child who had pediatric brain cancer. And as we've been doing work around caregiving and thinking about how a lot of our research and data really captures a snapshot in time, it captures three years at a time or five years at a time, it occurred to me that 
things that had happened when my sister was in infancy still impact her now as an adult, an independent adult in her 30s. And uh, everything from, you know, having a period of time where she wasn't eligible for health insurance to my mother making decisions about her career and when to go back to school because she needed to accommodate therapy sessions or chemotherapy or other types of medical care needs. You know, the, the challenge that I think so many families are facing now with, will I have coverage for health insurance through my employer? So even if I wanted to leave jobs or to move in a different direction, maybe I can't do that because not only do I need the health insurance coverage, but somebody I care for might need that same health insurance coverage. And then of course, I think there's the financial impact um, of, of caring for somebody with any type of a life altering condition, whether it's a child or an adult or um, even an older adult in your life that you have that immediate economic impact, but you know, 10 years out, 20 years out, 30 years out, what types of opportunity costs have been lost because you had to step out of the workforce to provide care to someone. And that's something we've been thinking a lot about with respect to the work that we do is if you've got two families and one where someone has to step out to provide care, what's the impact not only on that caregiver's immediate out-of-pocket costs, out of their immediate bottom line, but their social security and retirement, their long-term care savings, and the impact on their children as to what they may or may not have to give up in order um, to really thrive. So, you know, caregiving is a wonderful thing. It's an honor that people can take care of each other, but there's also a long shadow to caregiving that we don't always acknowledge. Yeah, and I think also I've um, having worked as a cashier at Walmart in store twenty six sixty. Um, I will in North Reading. One of the things that I saw in a lot of my coworkers is the the multi generational household situation that would come to play, where you would have a grandmother who was ill and a mother and a daughter who both worked at Walmart, and the decisions that they're making around who should quit their job or lessen their hours to care for the mom or to care for the father. So they're making decisions that's often based on who can who's bringing in the most money which means the millennial or the Gen Z is the one who's being asked to leave their job. And so I think when you get back to these disproportionate impacts that are gonna have a negative scaling impact, um, that's something that's critical to, to talk about. Um, and one other quick point to that end, Grace, which I know you and I talk about a lot, is that that fluidity point you made, which is we can't just focus our efforts to support the caregivers at employers, because guess what? A huge percent of caregivers have to leave. Um, and so it does need to be a community-wide ecosystem that we're building that sees caregivers and proactively goes to support them. So Nancy, you are not off the hook. I'm coming to you now. Um, and your cat, Chloe, who I hope will join us on this call. Um, so you're, you're most known and your role as director at the Office of Work Life at Harvard, which means you have the probably relatively challenging job of supporting Harvard's uh, high performing workforce across the board. You're also trained as a clinical social worker, which we just heard all of us have enormous respect for that aspect of your skill set. So we'll be calling you when we have questions. And you have worked for 30 years as a psychotherapist. You're also a teaching associate at Harvard Medical School. So you bring with you so much, I think, to this conversation. So thank you. Um, what less of us might know is your own history. I was surprised to hear you called your, you were a union brat, as you called it. And this came up because I was lamenting to this economic impact discussion. I think Carolyn gave the $1 billion human cost in Massachusetts. We know the last study that was done, which was five years ago, was the cost of, or the value of the unpaid labor of the caregiver workforce. Unpaid is $470 billion. That was five years ago, that was pre-COVID. So I think we can safely uh, gross that up. So from an economic development perspective, that's huge. I love to think if we could get all caregivers to go on strike, it would basically bring the country to its knees. If we were like, okay, every caregiver today, you're not doing it, but no caregiver would do that, right? Because that's care, that's what they do. So in our prep call, you were talking about the moral imperative of caring for the caregiver, but you also really beautifully articulated what I'll refer to, you referred to it as the financial imperative. And you shared about the recent Northeastern study that you've been part of, and you're thinking on childcare as an essential service. And so I wanna combine those two things. Mm -hmm. What, if anything, can you share about how unions are thinking about caregiving? 
And how might we think differently about caregiving issues and what we can and should be doing about it in practical, tactical ways right now based on that? Okay, good. Thank you. Well, listen, yeah, I'm a social worker. So I don't know, maybe Kinto is my next job. Uh, you sound like you're doing great things. And I just feel like the social workers need social workers too. You know, I've been a caregiver as well. There's a real thematic thread of interconnectivity between us all. I've got Southern roots. I have a disabled brother in Chicago. Um, we are all, I think, here because of these compelling histories that we hold. <clears throat> and um, my father was in the film business and he was impelled to become, actually to unionize the film business in Chicago in the 50s uh, because of some experiences he had when he was a teenager and was exposed to coal miners um, in uh, Appalachia and um, developed a consciousness, a progressive liberal consciousness that was all about reflecting on power and how power is grabbed or stolen or shared. And so he was a union leader for many years uh, in addition to being a, a filmmaker or because he was a filmmaker. That in turn, I think, in some ways, all of these different things made me kind of grow up uh, with the sensibility of a caregiver because of other family dynamics that, that I was born into. And, um, and also this sense of um, wishing to have influence on the system, wanting somehow to have more power than I could. I came to my family in the aftermath of my two-year-old sister's death. And so growing up with a wish to be able to shift the reality and the suffering and do something about that has somehow been uh, evolved into this idea of getting at the, the powerful, the power structures, and even more than that, the paradigms behind them. So now I feel strongly that before you can innovate, you need to really understand the foundational precepts, uh, the, the bones, the paradigm around how we decide what programs count, who counts, who do we invest in, do we wait for unions to bring issues to the table, right? Or do we recognize when the thing that they may not be negotiating on because let's face it, there are different kinds of unions in the world and we've got a whole bunch of them at Harvard. Well, I can't speak to the Harvard composition. I think we all know that there's some unions, unions with much more sort of male dominated members, male dominated leaders, more of an old paradigm way of thinking that these kinds of caregiving issues are women's issues, which of course they are because women are disproportionately bearing those uh, uh, responsibilities. But if they don't bring certain things to the table, do we then say, okay, we let sleeping dogs lie. And I would argue that COVID itself has given us a dress rehearsal for caregivers going on strike. When all the, the schools, all of the, the child care centers and child care providers, all of that is shutting down, we are still in crisis about that. And I think that is what is teaching us that it's not just the moral imperative about supporting people with their caregiving responsibilities, whether it's child care or elder care, there's a financial imperative. To the extent that the essential workers rely on essential services to show up and make sure that the buildings don't fall apart and the police keep running and you know, like all of these things keep, fires keep putting, keep being yeah. put out, that requires us to shift our paradigm and think about these all as essential services. So the question is, how do you get to the people who are in charge of thinking about what's important and how do you change that conversation? Well, we're glad you're doing that. And you can feel free to you know, share at, back with us when we share out with folks these resources. Anyone who's listening, who has access to a union leader, what, what should, I love your point, Swip that, switch, flip that presumption go proactively to that union and say, here's what we'd like to talk to you about as it relates to caregiving. I think that's, that's fundamental and vital. Um, so Duncan, you know, your model, the way you described it, what I understand of it is really so deeply human and it is one-to-one -one right now, but you're working on, you know, sort of the economics and the process implications, but also the, the impact implications of if you could make it one-to-many. 
And we also talked about ultimately what most caregivers need more than anything else is another caregiver who's been through what they've been through so they can commiserate. Um, and I know you're exploring all of those different models. Each of those different models have different economics and they generate different ROIs. And we want this session to be unbelievably and immediately actionable for anybody who's paying attention. So can you please put on your CFO, CFO hat for a second and share with us, get that out, why and how supporting caregivers right now has a positive top and bottom line impact for employers, but also more broadly for their communities? So I love this question particularly framed within the context of the CFO, because I think that this is a place where so many of these endeavors can go to die if they are not handled correctly. I, it puts CFOs in a very challenging position to be faced with questions like this, you know, like, should we take on the, the cost of this, um, this program, you know, or is it, and what happens is on the one hand, you're faced with a tangible expense, yeah, dollars and cents, these are the measures that a CFO is, uh, is evaluated on. And on the other hand, we have a large number of benefits that are intangible in their nature sort of thing. They're framed in you know, attrition, presenteeism, workplace disruption, early retirement, dis, you know, disproportionate effects on different populations. All things that have many, many variables that affect them and are incredibly hard to sort of you know, determine attribution. And so what happens in the CFO's chair is that they are looking at something which is on the one hand, it is so easy to say no to the cost and so hard to say yes to the sort of, you know, the, the promise of some value kind of thing. And so I think it's too early to address this question as we develop these solutions. And I don't want to put the CFO in that, you know, place. He's not, he, sh he or she should not be the arbiter of success, but a participant in finding a solution. And so if we were to reframe this a little bit, um, and to your point, making it actionable, sort of what could that look like? And I think the opportunity we have here, and particularly in the in the, the framework of this group, this, uh, this sort of group of interested people who are coming together to look for something new, is to begin a conversation which involves employers uh, and involves the finance and HR teams within those employers, that we begin to look at um, ways in which we are interested in supporting employee caregivers. And we start small and we begin to sort of, you know, do that work and then listen to the experiences of employee caregivers. Yeah, understand how it's affecting their work, understand how it's affecting their lives, and look for sort of items of value that we care about within the space, items that the CFO care about, items that HR care about, et cetera. With that insight, I think we can develop programs that can enhance and replicate that value and collectively together as employers in Massachusetts begin to build solutions that we have faith in from the ground up and that ultimately as we expand them, the data will come, but don't ask for the data in advance because it's not there yet. No. And I would say, and don't wait for the data that's not there yet to do no. something. First and foremost, thanking a caregiver, creating a culture where caregivers are seen is free. So if everyone in the organization started sharing their own personal stories, which people are doing more and more, that would change. I would also say um, most employers have an EAP in place and that employee assistance program if you unbundle it, if you peel back the titles that are on the services that are incredibly valuable and helpful that are in there, it includes things like legal assistance. You know, where can I get a financial aid? How can I find out in my community where there's a daycare? So all you employers who are listening, you don't have to spend any more money. Go to HR, say, can we unbundle the EAP services as they exist right now, rename them, and let our organization know in language that will resonate with them what exists. And then Duncan, I couldn't agree with you more. Then let's go ahead and build across our organizations this ability to recognize how to link these two things and to, to showcase the ROI that's associated with it. Um, Grace, I, I wanna come back to you because I love that you pointed out, I'm such a fan of caregivers are everywhere and they don't look like what you would expect. And we picture a 46 year old woman caring for her mom and that's true. And it is true that in September, women quit the workforce at 4x the rate of men from a Department of Labor statistics. But it is also true, and you pointed out, we know for sure in the Gen Z um, millennial population, the numbers get closer to 50-50. And I would actually argue that a number of guys are caregivers. They just don't use that term. They don't know what that term means. So I don't know if the data that comes back is always accurate for the older generations. 
Um, you talked, the, we've talked about the ROI, but you brought up something additional that I think we should take into consideration. I love the aspirational, let's go towards what's good, but sometimes it's good to know that there's a, something lurking in the background. Nancy, I know you love the, the fear part too, right? Let's scare people a little bit. Will you please scare us around the risk of litigation? Um, the compliance officer and the lawyers who are sitting in the basement right now, listening to this, um, waiting for someone to screw up. Um, can, can you do it if you don't mind in the context of your sex in the city analogy? Please. Yeah, I'm, ha I'm happy to. I appreciate that you want me to scare people uh, in October. You know, we're, we're on theme here. Um, so I watch way too much television and I was watching an episode of Sex and the City. And those of you who are familiar with the show, it's about a series of friends in New York in the early 2000s. And anyways, the main character loves very expensive shoes. So she goes to a friend's party and her friend says, you have to take your shoes off. And she says, no way, these are you know $500 shoes, forget it. And they go back and forth. And so finally she takes off her shoes and they get stolen. And so the whole episode, they're going back and forth about who has to pay for the shoes, whose responsibility. And as I was watching this, I was thinking, um, you know, towards the end of the episode, the main character writes a note to her friend and she says, basically, you decided to get married and to have kids and I got you presents for all of those milestone events. And so you owe me for the shoes. And I was thinking about this concept of um, choosing family and that in many ways, that's sort of how we treat caregivers in the workplace, that they are choosing um, to care for someone, whether it's um, they're choosing to take time off because their dad had a stroke or they're choosing to raise a child with Down syndrome or, you know, and there's been several law review articles that talk about that this creates a discriminatory stigma within the workplace because you um, not only say to yourself, well, they chose that, um, but you're also saying to yourself that um, what's the difference between that? And, you know, me deciding to take on as a hobby that I'm going to do films in my in my off time. So I, I think that creates an environment for discrimination that people aren't even always aware of. Um, I the other thing I would say is UC Hastings has done some work around family responsibilities discrimination, and they've seen an uptick in the number of cases related to elder care responsibilities. The last time they measured it, it was something like 650% increase from the time before they measured it. So, um, you know, to Duncan's point earlier, I would say CFOs are already asking these questions, right? And if someone comes to me um, as CEO and says, Grace, we really want to do this. The first thing I'm going to say is, well, how much does it cost, right? Like I, I can buy into the idea, but until my CFO tells me we can afford it, it doesn't matter. And so I think really looking at that total cost of not just being retention, you know, recruitment, competitiveness, but also that we're avoiding creating the type of risk that might give rise to EEOC complaints, that might uh, give rise to lawsuits related to gender discrimination. Um, you know, thinking about sort of the compliance side of what's the least that we can do, and then thinking about, okay, once we've hit that baseline, what's the best that we can do? And I, you know, I think companies are still grappling with a lot of that. Yeah, no, it's such such an important point that I I had never I never thought of it that way. So thank you, thank you. I hope it is as impactful on others as it has been on me and how we're thinking about how we we put support out there. Um, and I think also you just brought up, you know, I'm going to classify it under the terminology of a vulnerable population. And one of the things that our CDC study really showed was the vulnerability of caregivers, the unpaid caregiver, but it also showed the vulnerability of Black populations, Latinx populations. And when you start piling these things all on top of each other, um, there is an unbelievable opportunity to be sure we're doing all we can across, um, across this group. So Nancy, I, this is such a perfect tee up for you and the, the stigma conversation. And a lot of what you work to do is to bring out into the light these issues that people have not been talking about. And you know, we've discussed caregiving in general has been a stigma. Um, and for a while, I think many of us have felt as though that was beginning to change and that COVID um, has helped that change that faster and actually for good for caregivers. But you brought up, you were a little torn on that. And you talked about pluralistic ignorance, which I did not know what that meant. And I, I to me now I think of it, I'm gonna use it at my next Zoom tale. 
um, sort of the emperor has no clothes. Like, would you describe what that is? And how does it relate to what all of us can and should be doing to change the culture of how, of how caregivers are seen and supported? So plural, pluralistic uh, ignorance is a concept from sociology, which has been around actually for a very long time, originally looking at um, uh, pre-World War II attitudes in Germany about Adolf Hitler. Um, and in the early 60s, looking at attitudes about, for example, desegregation in the South. And um, the idea behind it is that there is this phenomenon that happens when in group behavior, when uh, there is something that is put forth and no one believes it, but everyone believes that everyone else believes it. And as a result, they conform to this false consensus. And so when you see things like, polls that ask very imprecise questions like, how are you doing emotionally? Suddenly all of these people, and we know the statistics, you just cited some really powerful statistics, right? Now there's this new study looking at the concern about suicide by gun death right now because of enhanced risk of suicidality. That I see these polls where we ask this question, how are we doing? And you see people saying, I'm fine, because <laughs> they put on a bright face, right? And I think caregivers do that too, because they know very well about the risks of being penalized. There's some re research that shows that managers actually believe, not all managers, but some uh, significant number of managers actually believe that they're, the women who report to them are less committed because of caregiving responsibilities even when they have no caregiving responsibilities. So, so it's deeply embedded. And what do you, at Harvard, what are you doing to combat pluralistic ignorance? Um, what a good question. Um, first of all, I think one of the things we try to um, respond to are, one of the things I try to do is link up a lot of different um, priorities. So institutional priority of well-being. That's global now, right? But what does that mean? And what are the costs associated with, for example, um, emotional health? And if you start to take apart your claims data, you can get a glimpse into how severe the diagnoses are around, say, clinical depression. Or what is also interesting, take a look at how the less severe um, but, but actually more prevalent um, uh, types of depression um, are costing the organization a lot of money, right? These are the walking wounded. These, this is all pre-COVID stuff. These are the walking wounded. These are the people who are having mild, um, almost subclinical depression, but they're showing up at primary care. Maybe it's psychopharmacology. I don't have a lot of the data behind this, but what we know is that this is where some of the big price tags are. And so one of the questions is not just, well, what's the cost of doing X? What's the cost of intervening here or honoring there? It's, it's shaking us all out of our slousy, our, our, our slumby, our, um, what I'm trying to say, drowsy slumber um, and asking what's the cost of not doing it? I think that's what you were talking about, Grace, right? It's turning it on its head and asking the question from first the financial, which then I think gives leadership an opportunity to be a little more receptive to their own moral Im impulse, which is there often, but just kind of lying dormant. Yeah, no, I think that um, is incredibly important. Um, and I, I would also say another free thing that goes back to is, again, if, if leaders across organizations, and leader doesn't have to mean you're the, in a C-suite, you're just a leader in any way, shape, or form, please start every single meeting from now on with, hey, everybody, I'm a caregiver. If you see my child run in or if I'm looking at my phone, it's because I'm stressed about my mom, I'm worried about my brother, like out yourself in your caregiving status so that you give permission through your actions for your employees to do the same thing. Alex, can I add one more thing to that? I implore everybody to begin to stop saying the new normal. Yeah. Because I think that when we say that, again, we pull for this pluralistic ignorance. I must be the only one, so therefore I'm wrong. So I'm gonna, and what it does is it, it dishonors, it discredits the lived experience of people who are suffering in any number of dimensions or multiple dimensions. It, there's nothing normal about it. We can talk about norms, new norms, but not new normal. And as leaders, as leaders with vested or not invested authority, we are in a position to support 
the, the whole, the community by speaking more of the truth. Yeah, I agree. Um, so Duncan, one of the other discussions we had, which I really loved because I feel it, it's not an approach that we in the 02139, you know, business Cambridge suburb um, think about enough, which is you are very proudly and with enormous intent staying small right now. That's and right. I revere you for that. Um, and not only is, is the money that is funding you not raised from VC, it's raised from, from, from the NIH, which is an extraordinary thing. And I think it's influencing in some ways the way you're going about what you're doing and all the things that you're listening to and what you're doing with those things that you're hearing and how you're applying them and thinking about scaling them. Can you share a few of the things that you've learned that have immediate implications for how we all think about innovation that we can bring to caregiving right now? Yeah, so that, it's a great point. We are a little unusual in that regard and, and thankfully so. Um, all too often, I, I know size and speed, you know, are seen as, you know, the, the answer to most business problems. And, uh, and I think this is one case where it's not. In fact, when we were looking into this space, um, we spoke to a lot of technologists who had, you know, explored this space. And a lot of the feedback we got from them was like, so primitive in this space, like this is an opportunity to own this space and the hubris that poured off these people was incredible and then we would turn to the people who are actually involved in the work of caregiving and they would be like yeah well these people are around for about six months and then they go away because you know for whatever reason it doesn't float their boat and i think you know our recognition in those sort of the two sides of those conversations was that you know this is a place that you know values humility and patience that you know it takes time to build trust and earn the right to work with the extraordinary individuals and people who have often spent decades in this space, you know, um, you know, giving them, them of themselves to this, uh, to this work. And, um, and so in the light of that, you know, we looked at different funding strategies and, and so, so sizing ourselves differently, the National Institutes of Health have been incredible supporters of our work in part because we, you know, have a strong focus on helping Alzheimer's caregivers and that's a huge strategic priority for them, but it has allowed us to take a very long-term view, one that is not sort of burdened by particular commercial interests. And by keeping the team small, we've been able to sort of stay, you know, responsive to the experiences that sort of we encounter. We were able to listen to the stories of individual caregivers. And while you might argue that staying small denies you the opportunity of data, it does not prevent you from um, a wealth of insights that come through all of these conversations. And so I think um, staying small makes sense, you know, for a time kind of thing. I think the flip side of that is you do want to sort of, you know, not think small. You always have to retain the, um, the goal of, you know, being able to be ambitious and be big. Um, and I think it's imperative that sort of even small organizations are talking to different levels of the ecosystem, whether that's, you know, municipalities, state, you know, the federal government, global companies, national companies, you know, um, regional caregiving organizations, all those things, because um, in this space, there are thousands of different points of light kind of thing. But I think there's still work to be done to align the efforts of a great many people and sort of create a really scalable solution in this space. So, um, you know, we're very hopeful that that can be the case. And, uh, and as I say, the opportunity to work with, you know, really amazing organization has not been denied to us because of our small size. So, yeah, well, we, we um, as a bootstrapper, we always say revenue is the best investor because it keeps you humble. Right, you can have a great idea in a corner and get it funded, but that doesn't mean you're changing lives. It is hard when you're having to face down the individuals that you're trying to impact. And communities are, can come across as messy and disorganized, but to your point around social workers, they actually are not. The solution just doesn't look like what you expect in a big glossy office with lots of food that everyone can eat. Um, not that I'm biased against that. Um, so Grace, I wanna take this long-term, uh, I wanna pull on this long-term thread for a second and bring it back to what I know you're also obsessed with, which is what can we do right now, right now, right now, right now. So you, you challenge the presumption that caregiving is a partisan issue, which I think is an important thing to think about right now. I can't imagine why. And you said caregiving is as American as apple pie. And I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful quote. If we reduce ourselves to our core, what I do think we will find is that what makes us alike is so much more than what makes us different. And what makes us alike 
is the need to care for others and to be cared for ourselves, to love and really to be loved. And that is the essence of caregiving. And there's a massive industry in that as we're discussing about. So that's the theme of innovation and what we're doing now that will support long-term change in a way that is sustainable, scalable, and informed by what has failed. You carry with you a little box of everything you've seen not work. And for a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators, that's actually much more important than the few examples we see of what is working. Can you talk about some of the, you can answer this however you want, but two things that I, I was curious about is the incredible work the VA is doing around relationships um, and also that, that overlap with the work of Francis Lewis. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'll just note, you know, it, it's funny because I was thinking about um, I, as a former debater myself, a uh, former high school speech and debate nerd and college speech and de debate nerd, I was thinking last week about empathy and caregiving and how um, a couple of years ago, somebody called me and said, um, do you have d research or data on people who are caring for their exes? And my first thought was, you know, it's like you flash back. I'm thinking about this, this uh, ex from college who told me they didn't care if I got hit by a bus. And I blurt out to this reporter, well, who in the world would care for their exes? <laughs> and, uh, but the funny thing is, of course, when I started, you know, calling researchers, there's quite a number of people and, uh, and, and some really powerful articles um, the New York Times did, um, one from 2005. And this woman was caring for an ex who had been abusive to her, um, who um, developed Alzheimer's and she felt like she was the only person that could take on that care responsibility. Now, I'm not saying that, um, that we should put ourselves in abusive situations or that we should be caring for people without support. But what struck me is that same motivation of even if this person has wronged me, even if I disagree vehemently with what they're doing, that I see them as a human being and I still need to take care of them, that, that underlying sense of empathy, I think drives a lot of the political will. And so you see everyone from, you know, former Senator uh, Hillary Clinton to President Obama to President Trump supporting different caregiving initiatives. Now the VA, I think has a really good model here their um, comprehensive program for assistance to family caregivers, which was originally designed for post 9-11 wounded vets, looks at um, not just training and support for the caregiver, but also assessing their ability to provide care, um, financial support and behavioral health support so that the caregiver can get counseling, not just for relationship issues they're having, but also just for any behavioral health um, problems that they're having. And I think that's a really good model. The other that, you know, when I think about sort of caregiving researchers that I'm, that I'm stalking online and following around, um, Francis Lewis out at the University of Washington had done some really interesting work around breast cancer and ovarian cancer and just advanced illness. And she found looking at heterosexual couples, men caring for women with ovarian cancer that, um, and, and again, this is, you know, in the aggregate, men wanted to sort of fix the problem and women wanted to be able to verbalize and grieve what was going on. So by teaching the men how to practice active listening and how to engage in self-care, it not only improved the relationships of these couples, but it also improved the physical health of both the person with cancer and the person who is taking care of them. And I think that's the other piece of this is that our, our mental and behavioral health is linked with our physical health. And yet so often we sort of shove mental and behavioral health off to the side without recognizing that that behavioral health component can drive a lot of the physical strain and our ability to cope and be resilient in the face of a life altering disease or disability. Yeah, and I think it gets back to the notion of we have to broaden our definition of what caregiving is and who is doing it. Um, and that really any care counts. And I was just thinking about it. one of my favorite questions to ask a big audience is um, in healthcare, do you have a disease, diabetes disease management program? Raise your hand. Yes. Do you have a cardiovascular disease? Yes. Do you have a divorce disease management program? No one raises their hands. But if you've been through a divorce, I was, even though I wanted it, it was a single worst experience of my life. And it had a profound and negative impact. And we know that COVID is impacted behavioral health. 
We know that caregivers have more issues in their relationship. So I think, again, as employers, anyone listening, this is something to be pulled out from the shadows into the light. So at the least we can start normalizing it. One other tip that I was just reminded of when you were talking is, um, I think when we're focusing on caregivers, we have to also, I know something that helped me in my caregiving situation for somebody who has dementia was a profound shift when I began to have empathy with what they were going through. It was very easy for me to articulate how frustrating it was to say the same thing for the 10th time. And I think that frustration was beginning to come off me. But when I read this actual book that helped me feel what this person was feeling, oh my God, did everything about how I was acting change. Um, because I stopped feeling frustrated and I started feeling enormous, enormous love and empathy. So I think that's an incredibly important um, tip that you're making. Thank you. Um, so Nancy, I think we're gonna switch over to questions. So people who've got questions, I'm gonna figure out how I can look at this on my chat thing. Um, but can you just give us two minutes, um, 90 seconds on, you, you've had this quote I loved in our prep call that elder care is where childcare was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna say, as someone who is needing help with elder care, mm -hmm. um, we don't have 20 years. So can mm -hmm. you tell us how to make a difference in the next 20 days, 20 weeks and 20 months? Sure. Um, yeah, so elder care and, and you know, child care is not as where we want it to be, but all of these things historically have been seen as personal problems. It's as you chose to have children, you chose to be born to your elderly parents, um, therefore it's your responsibility. And we do not have you know, a government or necessarily an employer that cares to take on that responsibility. And um, I think that one of the ways that we had advanced the childcare issue was more women got into the workplace and more women were leaving the workplace for other workplaces that were more friendly. So it has to do with programming and so forth. But <clears throat> I also think that in order to get to um, the leaders who are making decisions, um, it's, it's very interesting to elicit from them their personal stories of caregiving because we know that a substantial amount of leaders as well, I mean, senior executives as well as line employees have struggled with caregiving responsibilities. And to get people to talk about that out loud enables them to sort of join into the ranks of humanity. That's one thing. The other thing is that whenever there is a program or the whisper of a program or a statement or a something that indicates somebody leaning into this thing that doesn't seem to be privileged part of the conversation, I have learned that by encouraging the recipients of that, the line staff, for example, to thank directly those leaders who are responsible for it directly. Everybody's like, oh, they don't read my emails. Oh, they don't. Yeah, actually they do. Or somebody else does and brings it to their attention. And I've seen leaders really change their orientation to a problem when they hear other people talk about their gratitude for something that has occurred or their suffering and the way it impacts their ability to give all of themselves that they want to give, that they can give to the, to the workplace. No, I think it's an incredibly important point. Um, I know that Best Buy the reason they have continued to invest is because when they did their first pilots in supporting the unpaid family, unpaid caregiver, um, the outpouring of emails from folks to the leadership saying, yeah. saved my life was extraordinary. So everybody write lots of letters to the people who hold the purse strings. Um, so I know, um, Lawrence, you're um, back there and you, there's a poor, um, Paul, we had done some polls and I'm wondering if we have any answers to the polls, if you want to bring those up, that's great. Otherwise I'm going to go to a question we had from an audience member. Um, these were ones that were sent in ahead of time. What advice, I feel this to you, lovely panelists, what advice would you offer to an employer that is just starting to embrace building supports for their employees who are stepping into this role? Where should I start? We love this question. Thank you for this question. Where should they start? Anyone? Anyone? Alex, can you just repeat what advice yeah. would you give to an yep. employer who? What advice would you offer to an employer that is just starting to embrace building supports for their employees who are stepping into this role, or I will say on their behalf, who are already in this role? Where should I start? So I'll say where you should start share your own story um, and go to your HR department and go look at the EAP, unbundle the EAP, start 
making available through email or whatever communication mechanism your organization has everything that already exists and has already been paid for, including things like um, oh, the state of Massachusetts has amazing, we'll talk about this with Robin, amazing resources that can help right here in your back backyard. So number one, go talk to HR, figure out what exists already, unbundle it, share your story, invite others to share their story and, uh, and spread the information about those, those, those programs and resources that exist. Um, there's another question. Do you have any post survey results? This is a um, great question. From when employers have put programs in place and the impact of this made on both the employee and employer front. If yes, can you share mm. some of the results or metrics with us and offer advice on the right KPIs I should put in place as I consider, consider building in programs in my team seat or board to approve? So I think that let's, I'm going to ask that two ways. One, if you have data on metrics that have you know, actual data on metrics, great. If you don't, what metrics would you suggest people start looking to fill with data? Can Alex, let's go back for a second to the to the question that you just had. I mean, I think the I think the first place you start is by evaluating your own employees by a survey. I think the championship internally and having people talk openly is good, but I also think an anonymous survey where people don't feel that they'll be retaliated against if they answer honestly is really important and that can help drive data. Um, it's difficult to measure. And I think this is where it comes back into the basement of lawyers, right? That um, if somebody exits the workforce because they didn't have the accommodations they need, it's difficult to be able to tell that. And, and I can tell you from the study we do with AARP um, caregiving in the US, when you look at the questions we ask around work, we ask about what kinds of accommodations did you need? What was the impact of work on, or of caregiving on work? And then did you feel like you were subject to discrimination? So most caregivers say that they wish there were protections in place, but that they did not feel like they were subject to discrimination. And I think that's part of the challenge here is it, it it's not just the legal piece of discrimination, but how, how can you measure the adverse impact of something if we're not even necessarily acknowledging it exists? So I think starting with an internal survey is a good place to start. Yeah, and I will say um, anyone who wants to do that, Archangels, that's our obsession. That's what we do all the time. So, and I would also say that in holding up caregivers, we can't inadvertently denigrate those for whom they're caring. So. Grace, you and I talked a lot about the importance of language. So we've got to be about, it is hard for caregivers. It's also beautiful what caregivers do. And the person for whom they're caring for, we don't want them to ever feel any shame or like they're a burden. Um, and so looking at the wording of those surveys really, really, really carefully and the actionability of them, I think is a, is a key next step. Nancy, mm -hmm. I, I know you had a thought. I obviously went too fast on question number one. Um, is Nancy private message me like, can, can you be quiet and let me chat? <laughs> Um, thank you. Uh, so I would say, also going back to that question, um, I think surveys, absolutely yes. And also there is something about the private touch, the individual touch. I would say that leaders can go to their affinity groups, if they're large organizations, if they have affinity groups, employee resource groups, or even better business resource groups who are established to actually feed upwards uh, their experience so that they can have some influence on the development of policy and find out what people uh, who feel a little more safe because they're among their kind and they have a collective voice look at different coalitions that are developed, look at how um, the um, various um, uh, interest groups around you know, sexuality and gender or whatever it is, what they have to say about various issues. Go to general counsel, go to your recruiters, why are people saying no? Go to HR, why are people leaving? And then also go to the stakeholders or the directors um, or the, um, the people who hold the other, um, a, a range of institutional priorities. So for example, if you come and talk to the sustainability office about mental health, the sustainability office will tell you, as a matter of fact, globally, employee well-being is now a part of um, global organizations' well sustainability plans. So that matters as a part of trying to become a more sustainable institution. Let other people connect the dots to make it easier for leaders to construct a case for moving forward. Yeah, I love that. Duncan, did you want to jump in? 
No, what I, and what was coming to mind was that uh, the comments made about sort of dialogue and storytelling, which is so important because we tend to put labels on these things and say caregiving, but what we're really talking about is, you know, people being comfortable talking about the relationship with their parents, the family situation, you know, all these things. And I, you know, if I was, I was thinking through the metric question, I was like, oh, how would we measure that? And I would love to know, you know, how confident managers feel talking to their teens about their family situation in ways that are relevant to this topic, um, how skilled they feel, you know, so, you know, do they feel confident doing it? Do they have the skill set? Are they actually doing it? And because wouldn't it be wonderful if, you know, there was more that dialogue, but then just felt empowered and capable to have those conversations and that their teams, you know, in a natural part of their, of the way they interacted. Um, and I, I would also to that end, to the extent that an organization does have resources that can help just get those out there and share your story and how you used that resource and the impact it has had. Even if we haven't been able to do a study at your employer site yet, that this is the impact of this on that, individuals will have used things that have helped them. And if they share not only this is my story, but this is what I did, I went to a social worker and that social worker seemed to understand everything about me. And oh my gosh, it turns out I'm not the only millennial who's caring for someone with pancreatic cancer. That was amazing, I had no idea. Um, so I think that's a key one. What can the state do, knowing that we're gonna transition in a few minutes over to talking to Robin, um, what can the state do to encourage innovation and caregiving? You are three gorgeous Massachusetts minds. Um, talk to us or at least trans, <sighs> loving on Massachusetts, I will say, Grace. What can the state do? So we can feel incredibly supported by the state government. Um, we've had a lot of dialogue with both, you know, Lawrence's team and, um, and Robin's. Um, they've been very helpful in helping us to access the network and sort of build sort of connection and reputation and, uh, and these things. And um, I think there, what I would sort of say about the, the value that Massachusetts state government has provided to us is facilitating collaboration within the state. And that, I think, is you know, one of the keys to success here. Um, you can't go it alone. It is an, a, a tremendously rich and important ecosystem. And I think that, you know, from our perspective, that's been a huge sort of uh, opportunity and win. And so we're incredibly grateful to, to, to Robin and Lawrence for, for those opportunities. So before I'm going to go to you, Grace, next, before I just want to paraphrase what you said. So everybody who does not now live in Massachusetts, you should move to Massachusetts <laughs> and you should Absolutely. direct all of your innovative attention to Massachusetts. So start companies in Massachusetts, um, Massachusetts, Massachusetts. There is absolutely no reason why Massachusetts shouldn't be the leader in this field. In this well, I think many would, many would say it is, right? Yeah. So we just need to do more things to get these stories out because there is extraordinary stuff happening right now. Grace? Yeah, I'm not sure everyone moving to Massachusetts will work, but I like I like the energy. I like the excitement around that. Um, I would actually say uh, uh, state caregiving plans are a great way to go. Uh, similar to how we have a national Alzheimer's plan and state Alzheimer's plans, some states have begun to do um, plans uh, with their legislature around the needs of caregivers. Um, I think of places like Mississippi, New Mexico, Hawaii, uh, and, and I think that's a good place to start because, you know, the caregiving experience is very different from Boston than it is from Little Rock. Or, um, so, so I think really digging in on the state specific issues is important. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, look to your neighbors for innovation. You know, you, you don't have to always figure everything out from scratch. There are a lot of really interesting things happening, particularly in uh, New York, New Jersey, California, around caregiving. Um, Michigan has also invested a lot. So, I mean, keep thinking about like what other states are doing um, and identifying places where there's already been a practice that's been tested and that could be implemented or scaled. Love that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Nancy. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of research that shows that companies that have all these great policies around backup care and scholarships and all, all manner of policies, um, uh, parental leave, um, are underutilized. 
And uh, it turns out, of course, that there are all kinds of drivers for that, including education, levels of education, and how empowered people feel to actually make use of benefits without feeling that they're going to be penalized. We all have an opportunity as the new mass uh, paid caregiver leave is being rolled out over the next little while um, to pair that with messaging that really gets into some of these issues. Because if we're going to be announcing this new policy to employees, we can be asking them to reflect upon what do you, what's going to make it hard for you to make use of this leave? Um, does your manager, like we've got to talk to managers about it. In other words, to get a conversation going around what are going to be the impediments? What does that tell us about our organization? And how can we begin to get new ideas about how to address that? Yeah, I love that. The notion of pairing it with a conversation starter so people can begin to, again, draw this out so we can start having the conversation. Yeah. Um, we always joke about how it's most important to have, you can have good conversations about hard topics in the car because you're not looking at each other. Yeah. So maybe go sit next to whoever it is in your organization as part of this and like go for a walk, socially distant, so you can both be looking forward and start start asking these questions. I love that. Um, how can we how can we make these announcements about FMLA in a way that gets people to start talking about their own situation and connect them to resources that exist right now? There's so many, so many do. You guys, thank you so much. I'm going to um, transition over to Robin Lipson. Um, so thank you, thank you. And by the way, you guys will help make available. Um, I know we'll be able to make available to folks. I think this is happening in the chat. I'm having a hard time following the chat while yeah. paying attention to your beautiful faces. So. I think we will also make available to folks after um, where you can go to the website, Lawrence can share that, um, where, where, where your, the things that you've talked about where people can learn more. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm gonna, with that, roll over to Robin Lipson, Deputy Secretary at the end, at the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. Robin, how are you? Um, I'm good. Yeah. I am like taking notes like a crazy person. I have pieces of paper all over my desk here after listening to this panel. Yes, <laughs> I was being trying to figure out exactly what possibly to ask you. I want to start with um, where, well, start with wherever you want to. And then I liked the, the last point about FMLA, which was a topic we didn't get to cover um, that obviously is important to Massachusetts right now, especially given, always important, but especially given COVID. But you start wherever you would like to. How was that? Where did you feel as though you learned things that you would not have expected? Where do you wish that you could hear more? All right, well, it was such a rich and wonderful discussion and such great questions and such great insights. Let me start with one idea that I've been harboring for a while, um, which is that I don't think we should assume that we know what everyone needs and what will be most helpful. Um, I think that this is a highly individualized experience. And while there are common themes, we shouldn't assume that what everyone needs is 10 hours of respite care or what everyone needs is an in-home worker. Maybe, maybe they're worried about money, maybe they're not. Maybe what they're really concerned about is that their usual outlets for relaxation like are, are gone. You know, maybe you used to take the, the one that you are caring for to a local museum every Saturday. And that was just food for your soul and your brain. And you can't do that right now. Or maybe what you need is help navigating through some really hard behaviors that are just making you doubt your ability to do this, right? So um, we shouldn't assume we know what the answers are for people. And, and even in, in, you know, in some experience I'm very close to personally, sometimes the most troubling thing is not about how to organize care, but how to negotiate with a sibling or with a spouse who harbors resentment for whatever the situation is. So, so I, as we think about supporting people, we shouldn't assume we know what they need and we should create some mechanisms to encourage them to express what we what they need and then to respond accordingly. So I, I just kind of wanted to put that out there um, as, a, as a baseline idea that we didn't really talk about. Yeah, no, I think that's so important. And I think behind every caregiver is somebody who is suffering because they are behind that caregiver. So the notion of this ripple effect. So I know, for example, with my man in his caregiving role, um, and I am also in a caregiving role, I need to be doing a better job checking in on how are you? 
And how can I support you in what you're struggling with? Um, because the it is it is impacting him and his ability to not have any time to do the things that he would otherwise want to do. So I think that's a, a really important reminder is think outside the box about what are the ways you can be supporting somebody um, and who you are needing to support. I, I also think um, a question that we should all ban from our vocabulary, don't ask a caregiver, how can I help? Because caregivers are overwhelmed, they're exhausted, they're not even gonna know where to begin. That's an exhausting question. Just start helping. Observe and figure out something that they need and then start helping. Robin, what is the 800 number? Because I am having complete brain cramp. What it, can you list through some of the things that Massachusetts, which has yes. beautiful resources yes. Yes. right now, because some of the questions in the chat, I was like, Robin will know. <laughs> well, one of the questions was, uh, um, and I love this question, um, from someone who said they love the idea of talking to a social worker, like, where do I get one? How do I find one? So I want to tell you about one of the best kept secrets um, in our land, which is the Family Caregiver Support Program, which is a program run by um, the State Aging Agency, and it's funded with um, federal dollars. It, it is not a huge program. I think it's about $3 million that get invested in it. It's tiny. But um, in every geographic area of the state, there is a family caregiver support program. And you can get to that by calling or going online to mass options. And I'm hoping someone who's more coordinated than I am can put um, the number in there. And I know that Molly's actually typing mm -hmm. some resources in, but you go, you figure out where you live and then you will get to the family caregiver support program in your area. And those family caregiver support specialists are who you wanna to talk to if you're not getting what you need at your employer, or if you're just not comfortable disclosing what your issues are at your place of employment. These people are skilled, this is what they do. They can advise on everything from, you know, how do you get help to how do you take care of yourself to what classes should you take to figure out how to, how to be healthy or how to negotiate behaviors. Um, so that, that, that is a first stop for anybody who doesn't know where to go. Yeah. Um, that service has no income eligibility. It's free. Um, and it's a really solid place to start. Yeah. Most of the people that use that service are actually working. So these folks know how to talk to people at night <laughs> and, and outside of regular business hours and, and they are there. To support you. Yeah. I love that. Um, and I think also, Robin, you and I have talked a lot about in those conversations with a social worker, the social worker will be familiar with things that that individual is probably struggling with that they don't even know how to articulate. Exactly. And so the social worker can actually, as they begin to feel the thread of where this person's life is, is falling apart, to ask those other questions, because there will be multiple resources that can support. Um, I want to you know, one of the things I was thinking about the example that, that you and I have shared with each other about times when in our conversations, we've become aware of a way in which we're a caregiver that we hadn't had that we hadn't thought about before, which, you know, that's a founding part of why we're trying to do what we're trying to do with Archangels. Mm -hmm. And I loved the notion of how can we be sure that, you know, any employer is, is really sort of thinking through the implications of this for their organization. And we are talking about, if um, Carolyn were on the screen with us right now, she would be like, talk to me about top line, talk to me about bottom line. And she's <laughs> right, because we're all doing this because of our heart line, but we have to be able to show that this is gonna be sustainable. How does the state, if I can ask you, how does the state think of, of, a, of the ROI on caregiving? Well, I'll give you my perspective because I cannot speak for the entire state and I am neither a social worker nor a CFO, but, but I'm a policy wonk. Um, and, and the way I think about this is across the life cycle. We have to think about what we can do to keep people in the workforce. So I've been in this job for about five and a half years and very early on in it, as I was going around and meeting people, I met a woman who told me her story, which is a little bit different from the ones that some of you have shared already. So I will share it. She was a woman in her fifties, her husband had dementia, she had been working full time. And in the early stages of his illness, um, 
she just cut back a little bit on her hours. It didn't really impact her income, but she was able to spend more time with him. And, and it made sense to her. It was, it was a formula that worked. And as his disease progressed, she cut back more and more and more on her work hours because she thought that she should take care of him. And she didn't really feel, I'm not sure she really considered whether there were other options. And so what happened was here was a woman who was working full time, um, who cut back to three days a week, then two days a week. And then finally, it was harder to work two days a week than not work two days a week. And she became a full-time caregiver. Well, how did she support her family during that time? She spent her retirement savings. And this went on for several years. She used that money to pay her mortgage. And of course, at the end of this story, you know what happens. Her spouse dies. She's probably 60-ish. Um, she hasn't been in the workforce for five or six years. She has no savings. She struggles to get a new position. And, what, and what's happened to her is she has kind of started in this cycle of becoming impoverished and financially insecure, not to mention being isolated from the rest of her community and not being able to nurture herself. So, you know, when I think about bottom line, I think about the biggest possible picture and what we as a commonwealth have to do to support people across the life cycle of caregiving responsibilities. And that may be parents of kids with special needs. It could be people who have spouses who are disabled or who are caring for parents or siblings or whatever, but it's a broad spectrum of experiences. And we have to keep our eye on uh, supporting people's ability to be financially and economically secure. Because if we lose focus on that, it becomes very, very, very difficult to put it back together. again. Yeah. So no, that's my bottom line kind of explanation here. Yeah. Well, and I think the other thing that, that you're bringing up, first of all, if you are an employer and you see an, an associate, an employee cutting back, ritualistically cutting back more hours, that's a red flag to go find out what's going on in a very respectful way to see if there are ways that you can be helping or you're going to lose this. I mean, think about how much knowledge she had in her role that was lost um, when she left. And to your point, when she left to have, you know, that ultimately impacts across the state economically. Right. Um, two points on that. Number one, um, I think we have to also talk about grief. We are we are in a place right now across the country, but in no small part also here in Massachusetts where people are dying from COVID. Um, and they're dying in some cases from suicide, from the stress associated. And I think we don't know yet the impact that's going to have on us as individuals, as an employer, as an economy, mm -hmm. but paying attention to how we support employees with grief. And that is really, that is a stage of caregiving that we don't talk about as much as we should, but is very, very, very real and has, you know, legal burdens associated with it, administrative burdens associated with it. Um, I'm curious if you're familiar with anything that you got, are you seeing any activity beginning to sort of bubble up in your own organization around how to, how to help out in that stage? Well, let me tell you what, what we are seeing, because I think it's, it's really very pertinent to this conversation. Massachusetts is a state that made a commitment more than a dozen years ago to rebalance the way we think about where people get support. So we are a state that has put investments into the community so that people can age in community or if you have a disability, you can live in community and there's been year after year after year of investments to support people in the community. So our default assumption is that most people wanna be home however they define home. They prefer that to being in an institutional setting. So that has been our assumption and our framing for many, many, many years. And that's great, except what's happened in the last six months is that some of the community-based services that are critical to that equation working, things like adult day health programs or supportive day programs that, that help people who have cognitive impairments, if those programs are not able right now to operate at full capacity and caregivers at home do not have those as resources, 
that is well contributing to their state of being and their state of mind. And so we really, really need to think through how we navigate the many months or however long it is before we can have 35 people in a day program or 12 people sitting together around a table talking about art in a social support program or people with Parkinson's sitting in a drum circle. Um, and so, you know, we, I think many people are grieving the loss of those activities and are struggling to find ways to recreate them either virtually or in smaller groups or outside. I, I was looking at some photos yesterday of what's going on in community and I saw an outdoor socially distanced ukulele class for older adults, right? But, but that's not gonna work for everyone. Um, and, and we need to think through how to replace the services that aren't operating right now to support caregivers. Yeah, um, I agree. And I, um, two thoughts on that. One is um, on mass options, one of the things that is beautiful about it is if you, it's a one door, like if you call mass options, they will not hang up the phone with you until they find you something that helps, which I think is critical. And when you talk about navigating the many months, um, you know, in a technology centric culture, which Massachusetts, this part, this, this side of the state can, can be, we forget that not everybody has access to technology. And so we need to be sure that whatever we're classifying as innovation is gonna work. Um, we are doing an incredible job. Mass Tech is playing an extraordinary role in getting uh, bandwidth across, across the state for everybody. Um, but remembering not only will some individuals not have access to technology, but some individuals um, that won't be the right, what they actually need. And in these many months ahead, let's all share ideas with each other about how do we keep our loved ones from being lonely, but also how do we keep ourselves from being lonely in the right. role? And one other comment someone made in there, 100% right, caregivers are grieving before they lose their the person they're caring for. And that's very, very, very true. Um, so Lawrence, I know we are coming to the end. So I'm gonna pass it off to Lawrence, but just very quickly, Robin, anything, thank you for the great honor of you being here with us and for everything that you are doing. I mean, I, as long as I have known you, you've been a, a ferocious, ferocious advocate for all things care related and, and really a champion for caregivers. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. I'm deeply grateful for that. Thank you all. And, <laughs> thanks, Alex. Thanks, Robin. Thank you all. And thank you to all the panelists. I just want to um, say I'm Lawrence Stuntz. I'm the director of the Massachusetts e Health Institute, uh, the Lawrence that was <laughs> mentioned a few times. Our role as part of the Tech Collaborative is to help uh, support and grow the digital health ecosystem. So we support companies like Kinto Care uh, here in Massachusetts and are really interested if I saw there were several people in the chat talking about uh, their caregiving support company that they've been starting. Uh, give us a call and uh, let us know. Paul will post in the chat uh, how to get in touch with us. A uh, couple of quick things. We were talking, <laughs> so there was so much content that we didn't actually get to share uh, the results of the polls. Uh, one thing that really was interesting to me in that was, and maybe Paul, you can uh, throw up the uh, share if you've got it ready. Um, and so the one thing that was actually really interesting to me, I found here, I'll throw it up here, is that more people on the HR side, people thought it was pretty unlikely that uh, people in a caregiving role for an elder would share with their, uh, you know, share that uh, fact at work. Whereas among attendees, they said they were very likely to share that, actually more likely than uh, childcare. So I'm not sure what that means, but <laughs> we learn new things every day with, uh, with this work in caregiving. So uh, maybe it'll be something that we dig into in the next uh, area. As uh, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, about a year ago, we helped co-found the Massachusetts Caregiver Coalition. Uh, we've got our one-year anniversary webinar next month on the 19th. If you are available, we'd love to have you join us. I put the link to the registration in the chat. Um, and this is the first in a, what we hope will be a series of conversations on innovation and caregiving, uh, but we need your help. Uh, when you leave the webinar, you'll be presented with a survey and please fill it out and let us know what areas of innovation uh, we should dig into. Uh, what are the things that you've seen 
working in other parts of the country that we might adopt here? What are the things that, uh, you know, what are the ideas, what incentives should we be uh, should we be offering to try to drive innovation? What can employers be doing? What can communities be doing? We're thinking of this in a pretty broad way as we think about caregiving and family caregiver support broadly. So um, the, the way that we would, uh, the way that we would, uh, we'll just go on. There's a couple of things in the chat that we will also get back to. We will be sending out uh, sort of all the resources as part of a, a follow-up to this, and we encourage you uh, to keep keep in contact with us. We're really excited about this conversation around innovation and caregiving, and I just want to thank all the panelists, uh, the speakers, Carolyn, Chris, uh, the folks who helped put on the webinar behind the scenes, uh, Paul and Judy, uh, as well as the rest of the Massachusetts Caregiver Coalition organizing team, and all of you. So thank you very much and have a great, great weekend. Hey.